great. Yes, hello everyone to our webinar on biomarkers and uh, a new platform technology for identifying innovative biomarker signature, signatures which we want to present to you today. Uh, who are we? Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the VBU, VBU, Vereinigung Deutscher Biotech Unternehmen, uh, Association of German Biotechnology Companies. We're an, an integral part of uh, DECHEMA, Society for Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology, and our focus is on knowledge transfer and cooperation. So we connect companies and organizations from the life sciences. We are a platform where people meet virtually, like today, or physically at events. Um, we enable communication and uh, distribute information, and we offer access to a network with more than 5,800 members, which includes individuals, companies, organizations, institutions who are active in biotechnology, pharma, medical technology, and process engineering, with a lot of topical working groups on everything from systems biology to uh, bioprocessing and uh, hardcore plant engineering, and with a lot of other activities, especially in the field of the VBU, focusing on technology transfer, on, uh, the, um, on the needs of especially SMEs uh, who are looking for information, let's say, from business development to IP questions. So if you have any questions or are looking for information or for cooperation partners, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. So why are we talking about Psyomics today and about their biomarker platform, which is certainly something new, a good example for technology transfer, for making innovation come alive? Well, in 2015, Psyomics was one of the finalists at the first Achema Gründer Preis. This Achema Gründer Preis, Achema Startup Award, was installed on the occasion of Achema 2015, and it was divided into three categories energy, industrial biology, and analytics. And we had nine finalists from three categories, and Psyomics was one of them. And you see a picture here from the award ceremony uh, on the occasion of the opening of Achema. As we are now in the run-up to the next Achema Gründer Preis, which will be awarded on the 11th of June 2018, we questioned ourselves, well, what has happened to our finalists? Um, what has happened to their technologies? And we were quite curious to learn more about their, well, how they are faring and what they have developed since. And if you look at biomarkers in 2018, and if you Google it, you find a lot of hits on biomarkers for the wide range of, of applications, including extraterrestrial life, which is probably not our focus today, but also the question of how can biomarker help to predict diseases or how can biomarker help to choose the right therapy um, up to the point of personalized medicine? And that is where Psyomics comes into play with their biomarker platform technology. And I'll hand over now to Ronnie Schmidt. Ronnie Schmidt is the head of business development and uh, research at Psyomics, um, a company located in Heidelberg and active in the field of biomarkers. And he will tell you now about their technology and the development and the potential this technology may hold also for you. So, Mr. Schmidt, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. And it was a pleasure to be a finalist at the Achema Gründerpreis. It was a really nice occasion. We learned a lot and yeah, could really recommend uh, to take part in the Achema Gründerpreis. So, today, Psyomics, a few years later, um, we are focusing on innovative proteomics, and um, we are going from proteomic discovery to clinical application. We're covering um, the whole workflow, and yeah, let's dive right in. Psyomics um, is now four and a half years old, and we are a spin-off from the German Cancer Research Center. And we are still scientists. We work with uh, major universities and research institutes. Uh, all over Europe, the U.S., and yeah, mostly worldwide. Um, the vision we would like to fulfill, we are striving uh, forward to, is enable precision medicine, as already uh, was mentioned in the introduction. And we think that innovative biomarkers, innovative diagnostics is really the key for precision medicine. 
why precision medicine, how um, we aim for a proteomic discovery. The reason is quite simple. Um, if you look at genes, you have a limited number of mutations. If you look at transcripts, um, you get a lot of um, transcripts out of your uh, genome, but there are a lot of regulation steps between the transcript and the actual protein. So there are a lot of studies out there comparing transcription levels to protein levels, and the correlation is often quite poor, and you have a mean correlation between transcript and protein of about 0.5, and that's roughly as good as a coin throw, and we think that's not good enough. That's why we focus at what is really important for the phenotype, and these are the proteins. Usually, when you look at proteins, um, you have two big blocks of methods. You have mass spectrometry and immunobased assays like ELISA. The mass spectrometry has the advantage of um, having a high coverage, but also that's kind of a disadvantage because you get thousands of potential um, regulated proteins, and following this many proteins up might be very difficult, time-consuming. And other disadvantages are that you have a low throughput. It takes a long while to analyze uh, large sample cohorts, and you have to deplete, fractionate, and digest your samples. So you basically change your sample completely. And that makes the translation from mass spec discovery into clinical used assays, which are almost exclusively immunobased, very hard. You have a high attrition rate of biomarkers, and many of your projects just fail um, going for the uh, technology change. On the other hand, you have the classic uh, immunobased assays, be it ELISA, bead-based assays, so anything based on antibodies. They can use the native sample matrix. You don't have to change anything. You can just um, go for your protein isolation and then run your assay. So that's really easy. It's straightforward. It can be easily integrated into clinical workflows. But the disadvantage is with an ELISA, you can't screen thousands of targets in parallel. It's just not possible. And you have to select the, the proteins you want to look at quite carefully, and that narrows your view quite a lot. So what Psyomics is doing, we are taking the best from both worlds. Um, our platform is completely immunobased, so we have all the advantages of classic ELISA assays, but with a high coverage of more than 1,000 proteins in a single assay. And therefore, we have um, a large coverage. We offer a relevant hit list. So these are only 1,000 proteins, not 10,000, and only about 50 to 100 hits, not 5,000. So the translation going from our platform into validation studies, into clinical assays, it's much more straightforward, and the attrition rate of biomarkers is much lower. So the platform itself uh, was developed at the German Cancer Research Center and um, now optimized, and um, the focus was broadened within Psyomics in the last four and a half years. We offer now more than 1,000 proteins. We can look at protein expression levels. We can look at phosphorylation levels of these proteins, or both, all in the same assay. So we don't have any reproducibility problems when using uh, different assays to profile protein expression or phosphorylation, for example. Um, the platform has other advantages as well. We can work with very low amounts of samples. So cells, we can go for a few hundred thousand cells. Tissue, we can work with biopsy samples. And also for our plasma and uh, spinal fluid, we can work with very low volumes, saving money and enabling uh, resource-efficient uh, longitudinal studies in animals, for example. So we can reduce the amount of animals required for a timeline study of about 90%. So that has several advantages, cost, animal protection, and so on. And what does the array cover? So in total, uh, we cover almost any protein class available. So that's just a rough overview of what we have. Um, they are mostly signaling molecules, receptors, um, but all the other protein classes are covered as well, structural proteins, 
um, extracellular matrix, immune-related proteins, and so on. In terms of pathways, we have 135 pathways covered at the moment with our 1,000 uh, proteins, and they're really uh, broadly spread. So we have immune-related pathways, inflammation, uh, apoptosis, all the T cells, B cells, so all the immune cells, then um, all the apoptotic, uh, apoptotic pathways. But we have broadened the scope of the array also in the neurological field, so having a lot of Alzheimer, Parkinson-related proteins as well. So the array is broadly applicable for cancer, neurology, but also for infectious diseases, aging research, and regenerative medicine. <clears throat> to give you a short overview um, how the array works, what the results can look like, here are the pathways in cancer plotted and all the green targets are covered by our array. So you can see it's not a comprehensive coverage of all the pathways um, and not all the proteins are actually profiled. But we have um, key pathway players in all the relevant pathways for cancer and also for other disease areas. So um, the array will give you a really nice idea where something is changed. So for example, if you have um, a block in cell cycle, proliferation impulse, what kind of receptors are up and down regulated. So really, it's a discovery tool that gives you an overview of what is changing, uh, what you might want to follow up, um, where to develop your research into, which area, which pathways, protein class, or biological function. So it's a really versatile tool for discovery. Um, I mentioned we cannot only look at the protein expression levels, but also at post-translational modifications. So we have um, a phosphorylation analysis, and what you can see here is one of the typical figures you get out of such an analysis. Um, on the left side, you have um, all the proteins represented on the array as gray dots, and you can see uh, on the x-axis you have change in protein abundance, on the y-axis on phosphorylation abundance, and you can clearly see how a single protein uh, behaves. So is it changed on phosphorylation level only, protein and phosphorylation level, or what's going on with your favorite protein or your favorite protein? On the right side, you get a more detailed view of a protein. Um, you can see protein A is changed on phosphorylation and protein level, and protein B has just a change on phosphorylation level. It gets phosphorylated and often then activated. So that's a really um, yeah, crucial point to make. Um, please stop me anytime for questions if something is unclear, if you like to have yeah, more information on the subject. <clears throat> so what makes Thiomics special, as I mentioned? Uh, we are still scientists. We haven't really uh, gotten away from science. And that's why we not only do the analysis, with our partners and our clients, but also a complete data analysis. So what you can get out, or what you usually get out um, in terms of raw data from a thiophosphate study is a list with one million numbers, and that's it. So most people can't make anything uh, out of that. It takes them ages. So we offer a complete data analysis as well, um, including quality control, so are all the samples behaving as they should be. Uh, we do a cluster analysis to identify, for example, subgroups of patients. We can assess confounding factors, so smokers, non-smokers, uh, uh, pregnant women, for example, are always uh, nice outliers in a study if it's not known that they are pregnant, uh, things like that. Um, and then we go for the analysis of differential proteins, phosphorylation levels, uh, go for a classification in terms of pathways, biological function, location of the protein, and yeah, then we are open to further customize the data analysis depending on the requirements of the customer, requirements of the publication, requirements of a uh, grant application, or really the details of the project. So we strive to make it as uh, valuable as possible and also 
we can do the data analysis within a few weeks and usually clients not really um, accustomed to the data analysis take months or years even to make something out of it so we just shorten the timeline and get really information not only data to our partners and clients um, that's the technology just in a nutshell in a few minutes um, if there aren't any questions i would like to go on with the biomarker uh, case studies okay um, the first case study is designed to give you a really brief overview of what we can do with plasma samples and uh, we have done a study with the university hospital and the german cancer research center here in heidelberg looking at melanoma patients that undergo an anti-PD-1 biologic therapy. And the question asked was, can we extract the protein signature that is able to um, stratify patients in responding and non-responding patients by using plasma samples of these patients? So no biopsies, just plasma. So it's an easy to get um, sample type. And uh, yeah, the question was, can we do it? Um, we can. We found roughly uh, 55 proteins that can distinguish responding from non-responding patients at baseline. And here just two examples shown. So protein A, um, on the left side, on the far left, there is the baseline non-responder and then the baseline responder. And you can see protein A is clearly able to distinguish responding from non-responding patients. Um, on the right side, protein B is also able to distinguish between responding and non-responding patients at baseline, but also it has another quality. Protein B could be used as a therapy response marker as it has a um, high change of abundance uh, in responding patients after treatment. So this, of course, has to be followed up in a larger study. But it is very promising. We found a lot of proteins that can distinguish responding from non-responding patients and also proteins that could be used as a therapy response marker and therapy resistance markers later on. Another thing we have done is take the differential proteins we identified at baseline from the responding and non-responding patients and classified them according to their biological function. And what you can see for the non-responding patients, they have an active immune system. So they have a lot of positive regulation of immune response, positive regulation of T cell proliferation and all other immune cell um, proliferation and activation. And on the other hand, in the responding patients, you have a negative regulation of the program cell death axis. So that's the uh, prime target for the anti-PD-1, so the anti-programmed cell death uh, receptor drugs. Um, that's finding that was expected, that the axis is regulated, but what we didn't find is a coherent regulation of PD-1 or PDL one within these patients. So that's a really important finding. And yeah, just to make it short, the responding patients, so the responding patients to the anti-PD-1 drug had a down-regulated immune system and the blocked PD-1, PD-L1 cell death axis. The next study is uh, about occurrence, recurrence of bladder cancer. Um, it's quite extensive and I will just highlight a few key points uh, of the biomarker study just to show that um, the data derived from the microarray, so from our discovery platform, is valid. So other people have uh, validated our findings. And let's jump right in. Bladder cancer at the moment is often diagnosed very early. But um, the problem is if the primary tumor is removed, um, it will recur in about 60 to 70% of the patients. So that leads to um, astringent surveillance. You have to undergo a cytoscopy every three months, so at least it's uh, recommended to do it. Um, that leads to high surveillance costs 
and an especially high psychological burden uh, for the patients not knowing if the tumor recurs or not. And this leads to low compliance, which, which is yeah, not really uh, obvious, but yeah, the compliance for the surveillance cytoscopies is really low. And this leads to the unfortunate situation that the recurring tumor uh, is diagnosed late, it's already invasive, and then the prognosis is quite bleak because the tumor already has formed a, a metastasis and yeah, your prognosis is really bad. So the question was, can we find proteins from the primary tumor that can distinguish recurring from non-recurring tumors and therefore develop a biomarker signature that enables risk-adapted monitoring um, Precision, um, precision medicine, so risk-adapted therapy as well, and overall improve the outcome of all patients? The answer is yes, we can. We found more than 200 proteins that were regulated um, between recurrent and non-recurrent cancer, and uh, one finding was that we found active caspases, so apoptotic-related proteins upregulated in recurrent cancers. That was a finding we questioned at first, but then we looked into the literature and we found a lot of uh, publications from other um, research groups that also reported active caspase free levels to be high in patients with a worse prognosis and uh, lower disease-free survival times when patients uh, with low levels of active caspase free. So, um, yeah, other research groups had validated our findings and we were totally in line uh, with other publications there. We dug a little deeper and stumbled upon a few papers uh, describing a mechanism for the tumor recurrence, tumor repopulation also. And it's basically through increased apoptosis you create a chronic inflammatory environment, and the chronic inflammatory environment um, has a lot of growth stimulus for various cell types, and it leads to the repopulation um, of the tumor. So that was um, published in Nature Medicine. That's just one of the uh, many examples um, just talking about these mechanisms. And other mechanisms um, are talked about as well, and they all lead to a chronic inflammatory environment in the end. So you have tissue damage signaling, you have um, increased cytokine uh, release, but in the end it's a chronic inflammatory environment that always leads to tumor repopulation. Um, going away from single proteins, looking at pathways, we choose to uh, have a look at the TGF beta signaling pathways. And we found that the TGF beta pathway is completely downregulated in tumors with recurrence. All the uh, proteins in green are downregulated, and the pathway inhibitor, the MAP kinase 3, is strongly upregulated. So that's just an example of um, biological finding we can have with our uh, discovery platform, not only looking at biomarkers, but also having the underlying uh, mechanism um, of the disease, disease progression, or um, actually the cause of the disease. And that's especially valuable if you go for uh, patenting biomarkers, because it strengthens your IP position uh, immensely. And our Cyodiscover platform can deliver both at the same time, biological findings, mechanisms, and of course, the biomarkers you're looking for. Um, if you go uh, a little broader, away from a single pathway, more to biological functions, uh, we can do all kinds of analysis looking at um, different biological processes, for example, apoptosis, um, some death-inducing pathways, survival factors, uh, energy metabolism, cytokine release. So there are plenty of um, biological functions we cover and we can go into any kind of detail with the analysis and yeah, really getting the maximum value out of the analysis. Um, just closing the circle in, at the end of the biomarker study, um, 
we looked at another protein, C. June. Um, it's a very, very famous protein, and it was always associated with uh, resistance to chemotherapy, resistance to radiotherapy if found in certain tumors. And we just looked at the protein, looked at the um, recurrent and non-recurrent tumors, and found that it was upregulated in the recurrent tumors, and then went back uh, to the clinicians. And we actually found the link between chemotherapy resistance, c June expression, um, and aggressiveness of cancer. So that's a really important finding that was uh, backed up by the clinical data, that was backed up by literature, and also identified on our array. So that strengthens the, um, the quality of the data we can derive from an array analysis. Um, looking at c June again, um, different methods, transcription identified exactly what we found on the array, and also immunohistochemistry um, investigations revealed that increased c June expression leads to uh, a worse prognosis for the patients. So that's really perfectly in line with our array data. And that's the end of the biomarker case studies. I hope it wasn't too extensive. And if you have any questions, please, that would be the right moment. Then Thank I think I'm move on. <laughs> okay, um, great. That, that's, that's very interesting. Those case studies, just for my understanding, um, are they already uh, implemented clinically, or is it still more a proof of concept? Is it used uh, in actual treatment? No, no, it's not, not yet. So we are working on uh, bringing the biomarker signature for bladder cancer to the clinics, and we are at the moment working on a larger study for the first uh, case study, so the PD-1 treatment biomarker signature, but it's not actual in the clinic right now, so that's a very uh, long and costly process to mm. establish that. But we are on a good way. We have clinical partners that are very eager uh, to work with us and to implement it. So, yeah, hopefully mm. we will be able to report something more soon. Thanks. Great. Anything else? Yep, there's a question in the chat, if you can see it. Uh, I think I've answered that. Just oh, sorry. Right now, okay. uh, I think it goes in the in the same same direction as that. Um, then I think I will go on. Just the last part of the presentation. Uh, what happens after a discovery study? So I described how extensive the data sets can be. Um, you can look at pathways, biological functions. Um, have really a biological story out of your data, and then what's next? Usually, it's a validation, and we also offer um, verification validation of biomarker candidates using our custom arrays. So you have a lot of data. You have lists of proteins that might be interesting. You've read literature, uh, have extracted interesting candidates, have done a cytodiscover study, mass spec, uh, wherever you have derived your candidates of interest from. Um, you just come to us. We select the targets together. We um, are always happy to uh, ship in any expertise we can. Um, to assemble a panel of biomarker candidates, you would like to follow up uh, on a larger sample cohort. Um, you want to have antibody candidates against. So uh, targets are selected. Let's say we have 30 targets. That might be interesting uh, as a diagnostic uh, signature. So the question is, 30 targets, it's a little uh, too much for a usual clinical assay. So um, you would say five is, is a good number. So we would um, try to select the best ones. And this can be done using our custom arrays. And the usual way to go is have the targets, select antibodies against them, uh, do an in-depth quality control of the antibody candidates then produce the arrays and go for the sample profiling. And for the sample profiling, we offer the same uh, services, so data analysis or the array incubation 
um, as for the discovery study. So you get a comprehensive report back, get the best biomarker candidates, um, and we are, of course, always happy uh, to help you with any questions and then also planning further validation experiments, which clinical assay platform to go for, uh, what are the next steps. So we are really happy to help you with all that. Um, to wrap it up, Psyomics, um, we are active in the field of cancer research, neurology and immuno-oncology mainly. That's about 70% of the projects we do. But we have also a lot of uh, projects going on in other areas like aging research, regenerative medicine, uh, toxicology testing um, of new compounds, nanoparticles. Um, so it's a really broadly applicable platform. Um, what's not on here are infectious diseases. So we are moving uh, more and more into infectious diseases. And we have a quite nice coverage of cytokines, chemokines, and all immune-related um, cell markers. And yeah, that's it. That was Cyomics, our Cyodiscover platform. A few examples. And if you'd like to visit Heidelberg, do it in the fall. It's really lovely. Thanks a lot, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, lovely picture of the Heidelberg Castle. Um, I have another question. Um, you showed us that your technology is really applicable to a wide, wide range of, of potential users. Um, as you're a quite young company, you're probably focusing on specific areas. Who are you currently looking for in terms of potential cooperation partners? Um, first of all, we are quite open with the disease area. So um, let me just answer this in, in two parts. So the platform is broadly applicable, but the lab work for all these investigations is largely the same. So um, we have a team of scientists, um, now three and a half, um, just focusing on different areas so we can really have a broad coverage of disease areas. So um, what we are looking for are people from academia, research groups with um, interesting topics. So um, the PD-1 project was actually presented by our collaboration partner. Um, also for small biotech companies, small pharma companies just um, want to speed up their uh, research pipeline, their biomarker discovery, their companion diagnostic programs, but also for large pharma companies who basically want to do the same or just try something new, um, get things more cost effective, maybe looking for an outsourcing partner. So we are quite open with that. We have another question. Could you imagine to bring a medical device to the market? In principle, yes. But I think Siamix will be stay focused on early discovery. So uh, bringing biomarker signatures from the discovery to the verification phase, have a final uh, signature, let's say five proteins that have diagnostic value, and then actually partner with a company who is more experienced than us bringing it to the market. So, for example, Roche Diagnostics uh, or any other diagnostic company um, can move the biomarker signature through all the approval process much quicker than we could, and it just makes sense to partner the biomarker signatures. Mm. But it's, yeah, we, we could do it in the long term, but I think in the uh, short to midterm, we would go for a strong partner. Okay. Okay. I don't see any more questions at the moment, but I want to remind all our audience, if you have any questions afterwards or would like to be reminded of something or dig into more detail, don't hesitate to contact us or to contact uh, Mr. Schmidt directly. Uh, we'll be happy to provide any information you're looking for. And with that, I'm going to wrap up our webinar. Um, I'm looking for my slides, Mr. Hall. Oh, um, wait. Because as I said, that. this webinar was on occasion of the Achimak Gründer Preis follow-up from 2015. If you know young entrepreneurs, startups, active in the field of chemical engineering, chemistry, or biotechnology, um, 
they can still submit their business plans up to November 30th, 2017 to, to be part of the Achamal Gunda Prize 2018, the second edition. You will notice that we changed a little bit the setting. We don't have categories anymore. We are taking in any innovation that uh, fits with a general range of Achamal, which is very, very broad, as you know. So we are looking forward to anybody still joining us, and uh, please spread the word. And if you are interested in Dechema's pharma activities or want to know more on biomarkers or anything else we are doing in the field of pharma, visit our topical website, which you see here, uh, or you just go on Dechema.de and then on Themen or Topics, and then you find our pharma website with all the upcoming events, the publications, and anything else we are doing in this field and also the context that can answer almost any question on pharma. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a beautiful day. Thank you again, Mr. Schmidt, for this exciting presentation. You're and welcome. I hope to all meet you soon at the next webinar, and uh, otherwise just contact us. Thanks a lot, and goodbye. Great. Thank you very much. Goodbye.